Typhoon off the Coast of Japan by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2017. Typhoon off the Coast of Japan by Jack London. It was four bells in the morning watch. We had just finished breakfast when the order came forward for the watch on deck to stand by to heave her to and all hands stand by the boats. Port! Hard a port! cried our sailing master. Clew up the top sails. Let the flying jib run down. Back the jib over to windward and run down the foresail. And so was our schooner Sophie Sutherland hove to off the Japan coast near Cape Jerimo on April 10, 1893. Then came moments of bustle and confusion. There were eighteen men to man the six boats. Some were hooking on the falls, others casting off the lashings. Boat steerers appeared with boat compasses and water breakers, and boat pullers with the lunch boxes. Hunters were staggering under two or three shotguns, a rifle and heavy ammunition box, all of which were soon stowed away with their oilskins and mittens in the boats. The sailing master gave his last orders, and away we went, pulling three pairs of oars to gain our positions. We were in the weather boat, and so had a longer pull than the others. The first, second and third lee boats soon had all sail set and were running off to the southward and westward with the wind beam, while the schooner was running off to leeward of them, so that in case of accident the boats would have fair wind home. It was a glorious morning, but our boat steerer shook his head ominously as he glanced at the rising sun and prophetically muttered, Red sun in the morning, sailor take warning. The sun had an angry look, and a few light, fleecy nigger heads in that quarter seemed abashed and frightened, and soon disappeared. Away off to the northward, Cape Jerimo reared its black, forbidding head like some huge monster rising from the deep. The winter's snow, not yet entirely dissipated by the sun, covered it in patches of glistening white, over which the light wind swept on its way out to sea. Huge gulls rose slowly, fluttering their wings in the light breeze, and striking their webbed feet on the surface of the water for over half a mile before they could leave it. Hardly had the patter-patter died away, when a flock of sea-quail rose, and with whistling wings flew away to windward, where members of a large band of whales were disporting themselves, their blowings sounding like the exhaust of steam-engines. The harsh, discordant cries of a sea parrot grated unpleasantly on the ear and set half a dozen alert in a small band of seals that were ahead of us. Away they went, breaching and jumping entirely out of water. A seagull with slow, deliberate flight and long, majestic curves circled round us, and as a reminder of home a little English sparrow perched impudently on the foxhole's head and, cocking his head on one side, chirped merrily. The boats were soon among the seals, and the bang-bang of the guns could be heard from down to leeward. The wind was slowly rising, and by three o'clock, as, with a dozen seals in our boats, we were deliberating whether to go on or turn back, the recall flag was run up at the schooner's mizzen, a sure sign that with the rising wind the barometer was falling and that our sailing master was getting anxious for the welfare of the boats. Away we went before the wind with a single reef in our sail. With clenched teeth sat the boat steerer, grasping the steering oar firmly with both hands, his restless eyes on the alert, a glance at the schooner ahead as we rose on a sea, another at the main sheet, and then one astern where the dark ripple of the wind on the water told him of a coming puff or a large white cap that threatened to overwhelm us. The waves were holding high carnival, performing the strangest antics, as with wild glee they danced along in fierce pursuit, now up, now down, here, 
there and everywhere, until some great sea of liquid green with its milk-white crest of foam rose from the ocean's throbbing bosom and drove the others from view. But only for a moment, for again under new forms they reappeared. In the sun's path they wandered, where every ripple, great or small, every little spit or spray looked like molten silver, where the water lost its dark green colour and became a dazzling silvery flood, only to vanish and become a wild waste of sudden turbulence, each dark foreboding sea rising and breaking, then rolling on again. The dash, the sparkle, the silvery light soon vanished with the sun, which became obscured by black clouds that were rolling swiftly in from the west-northwest, apt heralds of the coming storm. We soon reached the schooner and found ourselves the last aboard. In a few minutes the seals were skinned, boats and decks washed, and we were down below by the roaring foxhole fire, with a wash, change of clothes, and a hot, substantial supper before us. Sail had been put on the schooner, as we had a run of seventy-five miles to make to the southward before morning, so as to get in the midst of the seals, out of which we had strayed during the last two days' hunting. We had the first watch from eight to midnight. The wind was soon blowing half a gale, and our sailing-master expected little sleep that night, as he paced up and down the poop. The topsails were soon clued up and made fast then the flying jib ran down and furled. Quite a sea was rolling by this time, occasionally breaking over the decks, flooding them and threatening to smash the boats. At six bells we were ordered to turn them over and put on storm lashings. This occupied us till eight bells, when we were relieved by the mid-watch. I was the last to go below, doing so just as the watch on deck was furling the spanker. Below all were asleep except our green hand, the bricklayer, who was dying of consumption. The wildly dancing movements of the sea-lamp cast a pale, flickering light through the foxhole, and turned to golden honey the drops of water on the yellow oilskins. In all the corners dark shadows seemed to come and go, while up in the eyes of her, beyond the pall bits, descending from deck to deck, where they seemed to lurk like some dragon at the cavern's mouth, it was dark as Erebus. Now and again the light seemed to penetrate for a moment, as the schooner rolled heavier than usual, only to recede, leaving it darker and blacker than before. The roar of the wind through the rigging came to the ear muffled like the distant rumble of a train crossing a trestle or the surf on the beach, while the loud crash of the seas on her weather bow seemed almost to rend the beams and planking asunder as it resounded through the foxhole. The creaking and groaning of the timbers, stanchions and bulkheads, as the strain the vessel was undergoing was felt, served to drown the groans of the dying man as he tossed uneasily in his bunk. The working of the foremast against the deck beams caused a shower of flaking powder to fall, and sent another sound mingling with the tumultuous storm. Small cascades of water streamed from the pole bits from the foxhole head above, and, joining issue with the streams from the wet oilskins, ran along the floor and disappeared aft into the main hold. At two bells in the middle watch, that is, in land parlance, one o'clock in the morning, the order was roared out on the forecastle, All hands on deck and shorten sail. Then the sleepy sailors tumbled out of their bunk and into their clothes, oilskins and sea boots, and up on deck. Tis when that order comes on cold, blustering nights, that Jack grimly mutters, Who would not sell a farm and go to sea? It was on deck that the force of the wind could be fully appreciated, especially after leaving the stifling foxhole. It seemed to stand up against you like a wall, making it almost impossible to move on the heaving decks or to breathe as the fierce gusts came dashing by. The schooner was hove to under jib, foresail and mainsail. We proceeded to lower the foresail and make it fast. The night was dark, greatly impeding our labour. 
Still, though not a star or the moon could pierce the black masses of storm clouds that obscured the sky as they swept along before the gale, nature aided us in a measure. A soft light emanated from the movement of the ocean. Each mighty sea, all phosphorescent and glowing with the tiny lights of myriads of animalculae, threatened to overwhelm us with a deluge of fire. Higher and higher, thinner and thinner, the crest grew as it began to curve and overtop preparatory to breaking, until with a roar it fell over the bulwark, a mass of soft glowing light and tons of water which sent the sailors sprawling in all directions, and left in each nook and cranny little specks of light that glowed and trembled, till the next sea washed them away, depositing new ones in their places. Sometimes several seas following each other with great rapidity and thundering down on our decks filled them full to the bulwarks, but soon they were discharged through the lee scuppers. To reef the mainsail we were forced to run off before the gale under the single reefed jib. By the time we had finished, the wind had forced up such tremendous sea that it was impossible to heave her to. Away we flew on the wings of the storm through the muck and flying spray. A wind sheer to starboard, then another to port, as the enormous seas struck the schooner astern and nearly broached her too. As day broke we took in the jib, leaving not a sail unfurled. Since we had begun scudding she had ceased to take the seas over her bow, but amidships they broke fast and furious. It was a dry storm in the matter of rain, but the force of the wind filled the air with fine spray, which flew as high as the cross-tress, and cut the face like a knife, making it impossible to see over a hundred yards ahead. The sea was a dark lead colour, as with long, slow, majestic roll it was heaped up by the wind into liquid mountains of foam. The wild antics of the schooner were sickening as she forged along. She would almost stop, as though climbing a mountain, then rapidly rolling to right and left as she gained the summit of a huge sea, she steadied herself and paused for a moment, as though affrighted at the yawning precipice before her. Like an avalanche she shot forward, and down as the sea astern struck her with the force of a thousand battering rams, burying her bow to the catheads in the milky foam at the bottom that came on deck in all directions forward, astern, to right and left, through the hawse pipes and over the rail. The wind began to drop, and by ten o'clock we were talking of heaving her too. We passed a ship, two schooners, and a four-masted barkentine under the smallest canvas, and at eleven o'clock, running up the spanker and jib, we hove her too, and in another hour we were beating back again against the after-sea, under full sail, to regain the sealing ground away to the westward. Below, a couple of men were sewing the bricklayer's body and canvas, preparatory to the sea burial. And so, with the storm, passed away the bricklayer's soul. End of Typhoon of the Coast of Japan Jack London's First Story Published at the age of 17.